I'm pretty excited looking around the room. We've got people here from philanthropy, from business, from impact investing, from government. We've got an amazing lineup of speakers. We've got academia. We've got the whole lot, actually. Um, as our Lord Mayor would no doubt attest, there's always a lot going on in Melbourne, lots to do. And I think you're at the hottest ticket in town because we were fully subscribed a month ago. So, So it tells me we've got the right ingredients in the room for the collaboration and partnership that Nikki's given such an important endorsement to, um, and also the right mix of expertise and enthusiasm for a gender lens. So at the end of today, we're going to be handing this challenge back to you to go forth and um, share the conversation and the learnings from today. Women are slightly more than half the population and we know that through the Deloitte Access Economics report on gender norms that Australia is losing $128 billion per annum, potentially, by holding on to rigid gender norms and not really looking at life through a gender lens and enabling that full contribution to be realised. So a gender lens is the key to seeing and addressing the negative aspects of these norms and ensuring equity and inclusion of women. So now we are going to have, I'm going to say the main event, um, but it's really the, the thing that will bring to life, I think, some of the challenges around the work that we're encouraging you to do. Um, so can I invite all of our panellists to come up? And I'm going to just simply hand over you, to you, Peter, and we look forward to the conversation. Thank you very much, Julie, and thank you for inviting me to, to share this panel discussion. I'm going to remind before I introduce them to you, my fellow panellists, to turn on their microphones if they haven't done so already. I hope you can all hear me clearly. Hopefully you'll hear us all clearly. So let me introduce our panel to you. Immediately to my left is Professor Joe Barrick, AM. Uh, Joe is Director of the Melbourne Social Equity Institute at, at the University of Melbourne, and she's Australia's leading researcher on social innovation and social enterprise. Um, Joe co-led Australia's biggest ever study of philanthropy and volunteering and is a member of Philanthropy Australia's Policy and Research Committee. Next to Joe is Doug Hilton, who AO, um, renowned uh, molecular and cellular biologist and chief executive of the CSIRO, his dream job, Doug told me earlier, yes. which is saying something. I think his previous job was director of WEHI, the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute of Medical Research and uh, Doug also sits on the board of Australians Investing in Women. Sally Cap AO is the first woman to be directly elected as Lord Mayor of Melbourne, a post she's held since 2018 and sadly is shortly to vacate. Um, and Sally's previous roles included as CEO of the Committee for Melbourne, Victorian uh, Executive Director of the Property Council of Australia, which is where I first met her, interviewing her about housing and uh, Agent General for Victoria in the UK, Europe and Israel. And on the end, Liz Yeo is uh, the Chief of Alliances at, uh, at the Paul Ramsey Foundation. So Liz is focused on forming strong alliances. We've heard a bit about alliances, collaborations, partnerships, uh, to create social change and help end disadvantage. Uh, and Liz has more than 35 years' experience in working in the community sector um, she was previously CEO of Newtown Neighbourhood Centre and Chair of Shelter New South Wales. So please join me in welcoming the panel. So the way this is going to run is that I'm going to ask a question of each of the panel and we're going to discuss the issues uh, together and then there will come uh, be an opportunity for you to ask questions and I'll remind you um, that while the event is being filmed, uh, as Julie said earlier, we can cut you out if you want to say something but don't want to be on the, on the final video. So just if you do want to do that, ask a question and say, but cut this out, um, and, and then we'll know and, 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 uh, and that'll be fine. So Joe, I'll start with you. Um, it, it's a, a pretty dumb question, really, but why do we need a piece of work like this? Surely, you know, we've, the, the, this is now part of mainstream policy thinking, isn't it, to apply a gender lens? <laughs> <laughs> yes, so the case has clearly been made. Um, I did want to make one observation, although previous speakers and the documents uh, already acknowledged that gender isn't binary and never has been. Um, and 
the case for uh, gender equity for women has been made, but the case for gender equity for uh, trans and non-binary uh, people has not yet been made, and Western science is not very good at dealing with it because of the way we do quantitative research. We often cut out the experiences um, of people uh, from minority uh, groups, and that is a real problem. Um, but moving on to the purpose of this project, why do we need it? Why do we need this research? The case has been made, but justice hasn't occurred yet. Um, you know, there's Julie's made, you know, cited data, there's um, bits of data cited um, through the documents that you'll see or have seen. Um, you know, we could draw down on myriad uh, examples. I just picked two today. 13% um, uh, national gender pay gap at the moment. Um, women lead uh, to your the data that you used, Julie, but the work that our colleagues at ACOS and UNSW have done, um, that women led, led households uh, experience nearly twice the rate of poverty uh, as male led households. So, you know, we're clearly not there. And uh, to some of the points that Alex made, uh, you know, it's disappointing to researchers that rational uh, evidence doesn't change things. Um, <laughs> disappointing to journalists as well. <laughs> yeah. uh, but um, it, we definitely do need culture change, and I think we, we, we also need to be brave and persistent. And I think that, that I think the brave part probably speaks to many of you because you've come to this event. But the persistent bit, and I think a lot of the work we do through Melbourne Social Equity Institute and our colleagues do, is, is trying to change uh, intractable problems that involve our, our polity or our citizenship and our, therefore our policy makers to also move and change. Um, and I was reminded of that when I was talking last night to my father and a friend of his who were both very wealthy uh, men in their uh, late 70s, early 80s. And you know, being brave with them doesn't work. Being persistent, being, <laughs> being um, incremental is what works. Um, the other thing I guess I'd wanted to observe is that uh, while policy, you know, we do, we currently have some policy shifts that we're seeing. We clearly have deep polarisation across our political um, uh, parties and, and ideologies, and that is being politicised and used. And so we're, in, we're at risk of you know, moving two steps forward, one step back. But the other observation to make, of course, is that philanthropy, like all of the not-for-profit sector, is private activity. It's private activity that exists to create public and community benefit, but it's private activity. So um, I would say I'm currently doing the, uh, direct, direct, doing the expert advisory work for the National Not-for-Profit not Sector Development Blueprint, um, and... Uh, the, the philanthropic sector is probably the sector that has, beyond regulation, has the least contact with government unless it strategically chooses to do so. So, you know, there's huge influence um, in this room and in the foundations and um, philanthropic resources that you convene. Um, they're not necessarily being informed by policy, and so that means we need to be looking to culture, to relationships to the um, networks of influence that we have um, broadly across the different uh, sectors that we are in. And when you say culture, I think um, we were chatting earlier and you were going to use the, the, the metaphor of glasses. Julie did it already. Yeah, but, but the idea that there are things we walk around that we, we just don't see, we take for normal, and we have to keep adjusting our vision to make those things visible to ourselves. And, and Absolutely. I think we can collectively not see things and that you know we, we do need to be self-reflexive and collectively self-reflexive about what we know to be true and 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 so on and I think also you know um, Alex briefly mentioned intersectionality intersectionalities apologies I've got MS and I'm a bit tired today um, uh, and uh, you know my reflection on that is it's a word that we can use and then we all move on um, you know the experience for for myself as a Woman with a non-Anglo-Celtic woman with disability, but the privilege of extreme education uh, and what comes with that is, is, is radically different to um, someone who holds some of those um, identities and doesn't have the privilege of education and what comes with that. So, you know, all of those things are at play, and that is complicated when we're talking about gender lens work because 
you know, then it becomes something of an octopus. Like, which bit of the octopus, which tentacle of the octopus do we pull to achieve social change? We know that gender, um, you know, that um, investing in women uh, in a more binary model uh, makes a difference. There's huge evidence for that. It's been going on since the 1970s at least, um, that when you invest in women, women invest in themselves, in family. Well, they invest in family and they invest in community um, at a substantial rate. Thanks, Joe. Sally Cap, I'm going to come to you next, um, just to take this one step further, because in your role as Lord Mayor, and indeed before that, you've been very concerned with housing, uh, very engaged with housing. Um, why is the gender lens, let's, let's go, and we won't, I promise Julie, I won't talk only about housing, uh, but why is the gender lens so important to housing in particular? Can I just say uh, thank you for the research to start with, Peter, thank you. Uh, I'm so fired up. I, I love it when I can come to events and, and see really substantive work. And of course, we're in a room of the converted today. I'm looking around uh, at a room of people who have a gender lens. So I think that's something we've really got to be mindful of uh, as well. But um, this is really exciting for adding uh, a lot of momentum and energy into a very important topic. Within the housing context, just to give you a sense of the, uh, the, the challenge we face in the city of Melbourne, currently as we look across the population of people experiencing homelessness, it's still about 56% men and 44% women. But when we look at the growth uh, in homelessness, 80% of that growth is in is women experiencing homelessness. So we're going to see those numbers change very, very quickly. Uh, one of the things that is uh, really encouraging and I think uh, a leadership role that philanthropy, philanthropy plays uh, is that uh, philanthropic leaders really go to where the need is. And we are seeing that. And thank you to all the uh, leaders here from philanthropy, Catherine Brown, who I've spent years working with at Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation, uh, has taught me a lot about this. Thank you, Catherine. But philanthropy um, beyond government, thank goodness, interesting stat, is uh, really going to the need. We've recently... Uh, started, when I say recent, I mean uh, years, uh, uh, working on a project in the city called Make Room, uh, which is about uh, housing solutions for people that are rough sleeping, particularly uh, focused there, people that are at their most vulnerable. And uh, in dealing with our philanthropic supporters that are literally a kaleidoscope of organisations, uh, that intention and leadership came through from the start. We need to make sure that this is a facility that can show priority for women and particular needs within the uh, cohort of women. And so uh, amongst many other measures, we have a floor dedicated to women, uh, particularly those in extreme circumstances so that they can receive special care and protection uh, in the facility. So I really want to acknowledge the role that philanthropy already played uh, in, in uh, really demanding and expecting that um, from their investment. Uh, but the growth in women experiencing homelessness uh, and is one side. The other side that we've already touched on is uh, what happens when we invest in women and the, uh, the exponential benefits that happen across our community and our city uh, when we do that. It is still shocking uh, to realise that, uh, as Julie said at the start, we are now more than 50% of the population and yet we are the biggest group of disadvantaged people within uh, population, women, because we are still so discriminated against in, in many, many ways, and yet we are more than 50% of the population. How did we let this happen? Uh, we need to see change, and that's one of the reasons I'm so excited about the report as well, identifying these pathways for others to put on a gender lens. I uh, accept that sometimes women can be blind to these things as well, but on the whole, being able to bring the entire population uh, on this discussion because we do need to see pace 
Uh, and uh, there are so many uh, reasons why we're not seeing pace, but I'm going to put it out there that really one of the biggest barriers is that we're not willing to have what are often uncomfortable, uh, uh, sometimes uh, conflict-based uh, and usually ferocious discussions to actually challenge the status quo uh, with the people who established the status quo and are very comfortable in the status quo. And uh, I believe that this research is going to help us by forming the right sorts of alliances uh, and measuring and giving guidance on how we can work better together to actually create the environments where we can really have those, uh, I call them challenge to improve conversations to try and take some of the the conflict and the fear out of it, but how do we have more of those challenge to improve conversations so that we can really push the pace of change uh, on uh, International Women's Day this year, the stat came out that at the current pace of change of women in leadership positions across a multitude of organisations and sectors, to get to equality will take another 130 years. That's not acceptable. <laughs> And so the pace at scale at which we change is important. Uh, and for us, uh, even using that housing context, there will be more women assisted uh, in uh, the facility that we're building, Make Room. It opens in August. But we know that in doing that, we're having more of the right sorts of conversations about, about why that's important and really uh, creating more of that exponential impact across the community. Thanks, Sally. So we obviously have to go far and fast at the same time yes. in, in terms of those, that, that statistic you just gave us. Um, Doug, uh, I'll come to you next. Um, the, the focus of my first two questions is about the gender lens, but this is also about collaborations and the importance of collaborations. And I guess in your field of medical science, all the big problems that medical science challenge that they tackle, they always they almost always involve collaborations of one sort. So what, what can the philanthropic and not-for-profit sector learn from your world of science about collaboration, do you think? Look, it's a great question, and your report, Alex, really resonated um, with everything I've experienced in collaborations. So you're right. To tackle big medical problems, or in Cyrus's case, tackle the big issues that confront us as a nation, um, requires scale. It requires, as you talked about, funding that is both commensurate with the scale of the problem and the longevity of finding the solutions. And even for an organisation like CSIRO, we have 6,300 people. We spend $1.6 billion a year. There are no meaningful problems nationally that we can work on alone. So you know, I think the first part of the answer is we have to come together to have a real crack at solving local problems, national problems, global problems. So I think for me, collaboration is the start of that. At a very personal level though, I've found those collaborations and especially the long-term strategic programmatic collaborations to be part of creating an environment where creative people can flourish. And so that, for me, has been very important. I'm not, uh, never been a scientist or a person who thrives alone or does my best work alone. I've been a person who needs to be challenged by those around me to have people that look at the world in very different ways um, who can come together creatively. Um, I've certainly benefited from having people like Eve Marlap, who I've known for 30 years and would count as a mentor, for their, for their patience in dealing with, you know, kind of sometimes brash, white, middle-class, Melbourneian scientists, and giving me a metaphorical and occasionally not-so-metaphorical <laughs> slap across the face. Not that we ever promote that sort of violence, but <laughs> metaphorical. Give you a metaphorical pair of glasses so you could see it. Yeah, I don't really. think Eve was doing glasses. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I think that those collaborations allow people with those different lenses, those different glasses, to impact a broader group. Um, 
And, you know, I can think of nothing else more fulfilling than bringing people together from different organisations, working together to tackle a big, meaningful problem over months and years. And to me, the commitment to do that, the commitment to those very personal relationships, you know, I think has a, you know, has a parallel in, and I've used this analogy a couple of times, has a parallel to dating. This is dangerous ground we're treading. But if you think about, you know, you think about, I've never used a dating app, way too old for that. Um, but the way you treat somebody you've met on Tinder, swiping left, swiping right, is very transactional. The way you treat somebody you meet who you think might be part of your life for the next 5, 10, 15 years is incredibly different. You want to wake up with that person, you want to come to work with that person, you want to collaborate with that person. It becomes a, a very much more patient, tolerant, communal relationship. And those relationships in my professional life I think are the ones that have led to the deepest, most profound impacts. And, you know, I, I would encourage all of you who work maybe in smaller philanthropic organisations to consider those, not partnerships, relationships that will allow you to de deliver greater impact but also allow you to have greater meaning in the journey you're taking. Thanks, Doug. And we might come back to a gender lens and, and how that's in, in sort of your thinking about science and, and, and medicine and, and so on. But let me come to you, uh, Liz. Um, so in the case studies, when you read through the, the, the case studies and the framework, um, it's noted that boards are sometimes seen as putting up barriers to applying a gender lens. They might question its value compared to other priorities, for example. Um, so what do you see as the challenges and opportunities indeed of applying a gender lens when it comes to engaging with boards. And I'm thinking both boards of philanthropies looking to distribute funds, but also not-for-profits, community organisations looking pitching for those funds. Thanks, Peter. I will answer the question. I just want to acknowledge first, Julie, all the work you've done on this. We're really proud to have supported it. Um, the board is and, um, and also, I feel very honoured to be on a very esteemed panel tonight. I'm the only one without two letters after my name. <laughs> no, no, no. So, I, I don't I'm know. I'm trying not to be, apart from Peter, I'm trying not to be intimidated by that. Um, and, uh, but I'm very happy to be here, and thanks, um, Julie, for persevering on trying to get the, the right date and time for everyone as well. But clearly, excellent, excellent turnout, so wonderful to see so many people. Um, the other thing I just want to acknowledge on the topic too is I'm, I'm actually very new to the philanthropic side of things relative to many people in this room who have many, many years of experience in this space, including my own colleagues like the fabulous Genevieve Timmons and, and Anna who's here tonight as well. And so I want to acknowledge their contribution um, working with Julie and, and many other of our fantastic peers um, here, in, here in Victoria. So it's nice to be here and, and, and see some of you. Um, but I am going to answer the question. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure there's many people in the room here who have been on or are on boards, probably multiple, I'm guessing, in some cases. Uh, so when we think about those challenges and opportunities, I'm going to be talking to a group of people who know all this very well, I'm sure, but the obvious ones, I think, and, and I've certainly been on non-profit boards and a relevant one that was mentioned recently, the Shelter, shelter Board in New South Wales, um, a very common thing, I think, for all boards is priorities. Like, you know, there are so many priorities. There are so many things you're trying to attend to when you're on a board or when you're a CEO reporting to a board. And so I think that's often a challenge, just the sheer volume of priorities that, that people are trying to get across, are trying to work out which thing is more important than the other. And certainly coming from where I and many others come from in the more in the not-for-profit world and in the trying to get resources to do the things that you're trying to do, uh, that's where you spend a lot of your time and energy, is how are we going to get the resources to try and deliver on this purpose that we have? So um, I think that they're pretty core cool challenges, and I'm sure... So, so then um, questions of gender, for yeah. example, might be seen as a distraction or a lower-order priority. Yes, it might be, oh, this is another thing, another process we've got to work through, another framework we've got to apply, 
and we're trying to think about you know how we become how we how we develop our reconciliation action plan and that's a significant investment in a in an organization of time and energy and effort we've got to think about um, how we're going to be a trauma-informed organisation, that's going to take a lot of time and energy and effort. So I think sometimes in terms of doing that as a... And I'm putting my... Now, I'm not mm. being a philanthropist, I'm putting my working in the community sector hat on. Um, that's something that you often think about is what's going to be involved. So I want to flip those to the opportunity because mm. where I see the opportunity, I'm a massive believer in so many opportunities come from the front line. So many of the opportunities come from the front line rather than the board. So if I take, and I'll just take it as a really brief, like, case in point example, and a very grassroots one from my, from my past life, is in terms of a gender lens. So a significant proportion of the funding that that organisation had was for homelessness, but it was very focused um, on boarding houses or rooming houses, they're known as in Victoria. And as people in Victoria would know, rooming houses or boarding houses tend to be predominantly men, yeah? So most of our clients were men, but we had a purpose, a broader purpose, where we wanted to address homelessness in our community. We wanted to end homelessness in our community. We felt that was completely solvable in our community. But our funding was tied to, you're funded for this service, for this cohort, whatever. But what the frontline staff brought up is they said, well, we're hearing, you know, there's increasing numbers of women who are experiencing homelessness. When we put on our one-stop shop or our event where people can come to seek the help that they need and meet with all the services in person, which in, in itself is a rare thing these days, that they could do that. They said, occasionally, a smattering of women come in, but they don't feel very safe mm -hmm. in that environment. It's full of men. It's full of men out of boarding houses um, or social housing or on the street. They did not feel safe. So it was the staff who said, what we need to do is we need to create a separate opportunity that's safe, that's appropriate, and also we need to do it with other partners. We need to do it with the Women and Girls Emergency Centre. We need to do it with the local domestic violence service. And when you're in a community context, again, as many people know, you have, I mean, this was a small organisation. We had over 100 partners that we were working with for that program, obviously, it was a small number. But to me, that's, that's where the opportunity is. It's actually... It's bringing it up <laughs> to, and then and then and then being able to talk to the board about see how this starts to address what's a real issue that we're talking about over here, but it's it's addressing it in a really practical um, grassroots kind of way. So um, that's probably where I often start is not just with the board, but bringing those stories and those examples to a board to illustrate this is why this matters. Fantastic. Thanks, Steve. Um, I will come to questions from you shortly, so if you've got a question, or if you want to ask a question, start uh, thinking about how you'll phrase it now to keep it nice and concise for us. But I, I wondered to, if there's a, a, one of the things we've maybe, it was touched on, I think, in Alex's presentation, but I'd like to throw it to anyone in the panel who wants to talk about it, is the, the fact that having a gender lens, while uh, different partners uh, may bring a different understanding of what that means, as Alex said, having that provides a kind of focus that enables um, a concerted, enables the collaboration. And I wonder uh, if, you, if any of you have a, a comment on that. I think, uh, and I touched on this before, but really what we need to do uh, is to encourage more uh, critical and curious uh, questions and conversations and that's what uh, I think the report helps us do because let's face it with a lot of uh, issues that we face in our community and I'll, I'll go back to homelessness uh, we've been talking about homelessness for decades in this nation and uh, when I came in six years ago as Lord Mayor I was told it's it's too difficult I see Bev on water here he's heard this before but uh, from launch, uh, it's too difficult, it's too costly, it's too complex, it, it just won't happen. Someone and yet, else's responsibility. Someone else's responsibility, all those sorts of things. But we just weren't asking the right questions and really, again, challenging the current systems and processes and, and structures uh, enough. When we had the pandemic crisis and there were no rules, everything was thrown out of the window and frankly we were 
all living in fear and panic for a while because of that, uh, we found ways to make sure that every single person in Melbourne that had been experiencing homelessness and sleeping on our streets had a safe place to sleep every night and support services and three meals a day. And we did that in a pandemic environment because the status quo had gone and we were forced into asking questions and putting on a different lens, if you like. We use, kept using that. And it gave us a different result at Pace at scale. Extraordinary. And we don't want to lose that. And so really pushing and shoving each other uh, to keep applying those lenses, it could be all sorts of um, lenses, uh, to uh, seek change is absolutely critical. Uh, but it also shows us that different outcomes are possible and achievable. And sometimes when we look at change, we think it is too hard and we go to incremental, and I would actually say we need to be bolder and, and the, the visibility, I don't even have mine on, that always helps. The visibility and velocity at which we move has a lot to do with uh, our ability as leaders. Everybody in this room has a leadership role to play in, in pushing up uh, uh, against uh, um, what we accept uh, as the current way of doing things. I think that's critical. Doug and I were talking about the most crazy thing before we walked in the room. Now I'm worried. No, no, it was a good one. Uh, and that is that currently in the world of health, uh, medicines are tested overwhelmingly, let's say, I think it's about 95%, on males and even on male mice even if they're medications that are only for women. How is this possible? Please, people, <laughs> we need to be applying a different lens and it can't be incremental. Um, and I'm it can't be polite even. Um, I think it can be civil and constructive and collaborative and cohesive, but we all need to make a commitment to actually asking more questions and pushing up against what we're currently accepting as boundaries. Uh, and again, this is why this sort of research is important, is because it equips us with some really constructive ways to be able to ask those questions and, uh, and challenge to improve. So I'd like others on, yeah, Joe, uh, others on the panel to respond to this idea that actually we need more robust conversations, less polite, civil but less polite, and actually we need to push harder. So, Jo? Um, so, hard agree, and although I think it's both and, not either or, I think the persistence needs to happen to, to you know, get in with so those true. who aren't even, you know, haven't even stepped the into the thinking. That, yeah. But I think, I mean, one thing to observe is that most of the research on um, collaborations shows that, uh, um, Success, and this is not a comment on the cases, but successful collaborative activity typically um, uh, shuts out the things that you don't agree about, and collaborations can end up having um, collaborators working on the things they can get on board with each other about, which often are you know, the consequence of those polite conversations. Uh, so that is why, you know, to your, you said the word boundary, so I've picked that up, Sally, well done. Um, the concept of boundary objects, I think that, that what um, has been produced by the team really uh, constitutes a boundary object. Boundary objects, in it's academic lingo, but they're basically devices, um, instruments that sit at the boundaries between um, uh, sectors, between people, between cultures, that help us to talk when we literally don't have a common language, help us to make sense of something together. So the notion of boundary um, objects comes from sense theories of sense making. And I think that that is what these sorts of resources and the lenses, the, you know, more broadly can bring is devices that help enable those brave conversations or those, you know, the getting stroppy with each other, um, but being tough on the issue rather than tough on the people. And that's often how you see change happen. Uh, and I think that that's super important in this context. The other thing I would acknowledge is, and we made very purposeful choices. I wasn't you know, acknowledge I was, you know, I was a peripheral researcher. I acknowledge Kylie and Victor and, and Alex for their work, but 
a purposeful choice was made about not speaking with um, the women who were in the um, uh, case study situations, partly because of what was going on for them at the time with regard to transitioning into housing. Um, but that is the other part, and I have to say it on behalf of Melbourne Social Equity Institute, we are driven by community engaged and co-productive research. And it is not a criticism of anyone in this room, and I know there's a lot of nodding going on, so I think there's probably also a fair bit of agreement. But we cannot solve problems without the lived expertise of the people who are experiencing the problems. They are the absolute experts in the problems, and they command particular resources they don't necessarily command the capital, and capital is the tail that usually wags the dog of social change, but they command huge knowledge resources, experience, and it is critically important that they are appropriately brought into conversations in ways that are useful to them as well. It's not just an extractive exercise, that we pay what it takes to do that, uh, and that we you know, really create equitable space for the different kinds of voices needed for those tough conversations. Sorry, I've got a bit hyped up. Oh, great. <laughs> great, thanks, Joe. Um, uh, so, Doug, have you had to have a lot of robust conversations around... I mean, Sally made the point about science research being based on then even crash funnies and all that sort of thing. Have you had to have a whole lot of robust conversations to uh, on these sorts of topics? No, oh, absolutely. Um, certainly, running a medical research institute, um, we needed to drag ourselves into the... It was probably the 20th century first, but the 21st century in terms of, you know, how we thought about the long-term implications and development of the discoveries we were making. Um, you know, I talked in the green room um, about the fact that probably for the first 20 years of my career, and excuse it for the non-medical researchers, I used eight-week-old male C57 black six mice. That's one strain of genetically inbred mice and only use males and never questioned it. And you know, it was it was people like Eve who said, This is outrageous. And it was a reflex, it was what I was taught, it was the protocol, it I had no glasses on. I, I did not have a lens that I was looking through. So that, those sort of things are important. And then the questions begin you know, we were a big institution, 1,500 people. The questions began in the seminars. Why did you only use those, that sex of mice? You know, did you think about different ages of mice? Because we don't give the medicines all to 25-year-old equivalent mice, you know, at the peak of their capacity, right? So there were all of these questions about, you know, thinking five, 10 years ahead about what that development pathway would look like. And I, you know, I, I found that the conversations that were precipitated in those moments were really the kind of gateway conversations to thinking about intersectionality. So it would, I think it would have been difficult 20 years ago in that institution to talk in a way about intersectionality um, that would have had traction. Um, but I think having the binary gender conversation first and then using that as a stepping stone to, I think, richer conversations about intersectionality and diversity um, have got us to a point now um, where we've got momentum, right? And it's still a lot of work to do. You know, you never want to be complacent about those things, but there is a genuine momentum to thinking about the diversity of the teams and the visibility of our teams to people in the community. You know, people in the community who might be the ones that have the idea that allows us to, you know, think about a, a breakthrough in climate change or carbon capture or whatever it is. Um, I think it goes to another point too, which comes through very strongly in the research, which is, you know, we often think about gender in terms of gender equality, you know, that women should be paid equally with men, those sort of equal opportunities and so on. But what comes through to me, and by anyone that panel to comment on this is that actually applying a gender lens is isn't about isn't just about equality it's about better outcomes for everyone absolutely that, that, that it's, it's not a kind of either or we've got to even up or it is that evening up of course but it's it's more than that I wonder if any 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 thoughts on that I'm happy to maybe respond with one um, one uh, example I guess that's occurring to me um, 
in terms of ultimately what, what, why we're doing this, right, is to get a shift, to get something to, get something to change. And the example that's occurring to me um, was some research that Anne Summers did that people may have heard about called violence or pov the choice, violence or poverty. And it, was, it came about with looking at the significant proportion of single parents who are women who've left domestic violence situations and who are on that, getting that single parenting um, benefit, which was cut. And that's an example to me of like a, a gender lens that was predominantly women who are affected, single women who come out of domestic violence situations. And it's also, to the point earlier, it was a combination of a powerful piece of research that required access to data that was difficult to get and all that sort of stuff. Powerful piece of research. And then the voice of, to Joe's point, those women getting access because there was a policy champion with a, you know, a position of influence like Anne Summers who could get in the doors of, of, of Parliament, but also it was the voices of those women who were impacted by that policy decision to reduce that single parent or to stop that single parenting payment younger. So that whole combination, let alone the women and many others I'm sure who, who would have battled for this over many years, but that combination of things um, to me speaks to both the previous conversation about what it takes. So you need the people who bang down the doors and, um, and, you, need, um, yeah, and you need to pay attention to it, what issue is most affecting people because of their gender in this case. Yeah. yeah. And just picking up on that, I think that that is the report where Anne acknowledged that the data that were available was not inclusive of um, gender diverse people, which goes to my earlier comment about, and that's something that, that all of us who are academics and in the sciences and social sciences need to to address. It's you know it's not good enough to just say oh quantitative research means that we're never going to find out anything about a certain group. First Nations people in particular have pushed back against that for a very long time, quite rightly, and we need to to do work on that. But to your question, um, I mean I'm commented in my first our first round of discussion that there is clear evidence that. You know, if you invest in women, it creates outcomes for a lot of people. I mean, you know, there's a glib thing if you give the man a fish. If you, you know, if you give the man a fish, he eats for a day. And if you teach him how to fish, he, you know, eats for his life. And then if you give a woman, if you teach a woman how to fish, then the whole village gets fed for life. <laughs> um, but for anyone who that feels a bit uncomfortable, I feel a bit uncomfortable about that because that's gender stereotyping, right? Um, but that, you know, that it's, it is a consequence of the way we're socialised. It's yeah. not the consequence of who, you know, what's right or wrong. It's it's just how we're socialised. But um, but I do think to you know Sally's comments on the brave conversations and you know I, it's fairly clear in the way I speak how I feel about things. Um, the power does need to be ceded. It's not you know it, it isn't just the case that we invest in women and we have radical transformation and everyone is better. I mean, I think we're better. I think when we are inclusive and diverse that we have a more innovative system, that we have a more just system, and I think that that creates collective value. But it's not going to be completely without, you know, some disruption to power structures that have persisted for a very long time and allow for... Um, you know, the comfort of uh, particular social groups. And I think that's one of the things that, that is challenging. You know, I think we know social movement um, research shows very clearly that humans get together when they feel an immediate threat to their lives. And so the pandemic example that you gave, Sally, is that example of where collective action happens spontaneously because we feel at risk. Um, it's quite hard to uh, generate that kind of collectivism in a context where we don't feel like we're all experiencing the same risk together. Uh, and I think that's one of the ongoing challenges of this work, um, is uh, being able to be brave, to um, disrupt, and also to provide, to recognise them that we need to find the means by which we address the disruption and the discomfort that that creates for people who've people or groups, who, I should say not people, but groups who've experienced privilege and, and you know, and um, the status quo is actually preferential. I, I was just going to build on it, particularly in the context of this research, because collaborations are really the slipstream for change. 
because you've got groups of people with diverse skills and capabilities and perspectives and opinions coming together uh, and we end up with, you know, an exponential uh, improvement. That's the idea. So we absolutely need collaborations. And, and let's face it, people looking for innovation or invention or change and doing, doing it on their own, uh, they're normally just shouting to the sky or, or they're in an echo chamber of some sort. It's, it's very, very rare. So we need these collaborations. But to have these sorts of conversations and to push the boundaries that we're talking about, we need leaders, and frankly, it's it's really looking to particularly male leaders uh, in organisations uh, uh, and communities uh, around Australia to be able to create the uh, environments in which people trust and respect everybody else in the collaboration and trust and respect these types of conversations because for challenge to improve to work, it's got to be given in the right way and that is the focus on the issue um, with respect for uh, everyone around the table and a trust uh, that it will be received in the right way. And then, of course, on the other side of the table, you need to receive it um, with that trust and respect as well, to actually listen and to consider uh, and uh, to uh, utilise uh, that. So, again, this is why I think frameworks are important and why it's... it's I hope people use these frameworks because at its basis is setting up the environments uh, or the levers, was it the tentacles you use, the octopus tentacles? Oh, me. Which of those you can use, sorry, uh, Joe, to be able to create those environments for effective collaborations. And uh, we, we all need more of that. Uh, if you apply the female lens, a bit easier for me to, to apply the female lens. I'm still missing lots of other lenses in different issues and challenges we're facing as a city. And so that ability to build up those collaborations, which may be one meeting or it could be something that goes for years, Joe, to your point, uh, is, is absolutely critical. And, and again, I just want to keep coming back to the work. That's why it's so important to have the frameworks. Now, we've got time for some questions. If you've got a question, grab your opportunity. Michael? Thanks for that. Uh, Michael Q, I'm the CEO of St Patrick's, who's delivering the My Home project in Western Australia. Oh, I think we're getting you a microphone. Sorry, oh, Michael. Yeah. Thanks, Julie. Michael Q from St Patrick's in Western Australia, delivering the My Home project. I've got a question particularly for Liz, if I may. Um, you were talking uh, earlier to the point of um, uh, informing and convincing boards in terms of a gender lens and I really resonated with what you said about the importance of the front line and also what you, Joe, you said about um, lived experience. I wonder if another element uh, in the equation, particularly for boards of uh, philanthropists, um, is um, a trusted relationship with not-for-profits and being influenced and informed by their expertise, which brings with it, of course, lived experience, brings the front line in terms of how they allocate resources, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, is there, is there a particular part of that? I just want to check I've got the right question. Yeah. What I've found, I guess, being in the yeah. not-for-profit sector is, is often um, uh, philanthropy, if I can say so respectfully, comes uh, to the table with very preconceived ideas of what works and what's important. Yeah. And I wonder if there's a, a, a greater way to be put on the, the advice and opinions and expertise of the not-for-profit sector in right. allocating thank, those thanks. resources. Thank you, Mike. Sorry, thank you for clarifying that. Um, yeah, look, I absolutely agree with the premise that, you know, the, the people who know what's going on, first of all, it's the people who actually live this experience and the people who are closest to them, which is, you know, the people working with those people in their context, um, in their place, in their community, um, in their organisation. So I think absolutely we have to listen to that. Um, our foundation at the moment has been going through a, a period where we've been actually working with someone with lived experience to help us develop what is our lived experience action plan. So how do we as a foundation need to consider um, the way we bring in lived experience to every element of what we do into the mix of the, you know, who makes up the organisation through to our decision-making processes. So that's a process that we've been deeply engaged in and a key part of that process has been talking to, guess what, partners, many of whom have fabulous experience in this space. So, you know, think of people like ACOS, um, have great experience in this space. 
um, partners like that and, of course, peers, many of whom would be in the room, who have fantastic experience as well in, in listening to and working out how they bring in that lived experience into the way they think about it. I'll be the first to say, and I'm sure my colleagues would as well, we've got a lot to learn in this space. We're very open to that learning and, um, and we've got, we're going to be bringing our own you know, framework through the process that, that um, we've had someone working with us on. How do we do this? How do we do it systematically, not just, oh, remember lived experience. We've got to do it systematically. Yeah. Thanks, Liz. Further questions? Yeah, Liz? It's slightly a comment. It's just an observation. Right. <laughs> um, Catherine Brown. Um, just thinking the important role of philanthropy in actually funding collaborations and networks, as I listened to you, we, we funded the Melbourne, uh, when we, I shouldn't say that, they, the Lord Mayor's <laughs> Charitable Foundation, um, funded at the City of Melbourne, um, the Melbourne Homelessness Service Coordination Project quite some years ago, which then led to all the rough sleeping network and so on. Um, and you know the great work that's happened, and I and I can think in you know the Climate and Health Alliance, the Sustained Food Network, um, even the Australian Environmental Grantmakers Network, you guys, Australian Investing Women, all of those networks and collaborations are critical to this great work, and including genderized work, and philanthropy must fund them. And it is not sexy stuff to fund. And sometimes boards go, what? That's not you know. That's not exciting, that's not great, but it's something absolutely critical. That, that's all I would say. Thanks for I thoroughly agree, Catherine. Yeah. I'm, I'm, the, uh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Liz. It's the boring work of social innovation sometimes, but it yeah. needs to be invested in it. We have, I mean, sorry to jump in, Liz, but my reaction is because of the not profit sector development blueprint work I've been doing and, and all the thinking that I've been doing about, you know, Canada is a great example where um, investing in intermediation and collaboration and the, you know, the process aspects of getting stuff done is just pretty standard. And it's so not standard here. So you just cited a whole lot of examples that are exemplary. Sorry, that's bad grammar. Um, you know, but they're, they're, they're actually novel in the environment and it's a real problem, you, you know, and I'm not sure that it's necessarily always a um, responsibility of philanthropy, it's also a problem of government. Government doesn't in this country fund um, the, the process work that's needed you to can't, make this. You can't cut a ribbon on a process. Exactly right, there's no, there's no good announcement. Um, and you have. <laughs> I'm happy to jump in briefly on this one too with a big ditto, 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 ditto. <laughs> like this, the work of the glue, you know, is, is just, is so fundamental to social change and that's ultimately what we're after, is social change, not, 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 not just a whole lot of great projects, we're after social change. So, um, you know, one of the big collaborations that I know a number of philanthropies are involved in at the moment is the investment dialogue for Australia's children. And that would be an example of where, you know, there's a lot of place-based work that the government invests a lot of money in um, and a number of philanthropies do as well. And it's how do we start to work with government in this collaboration to start to say, see how important, I mean, you know, people have been saying it for years, but, you know, see how important this stuff is, this glue is. So we'll, 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 we'll do it where, where, we, where, where we can and we should, but we want to be able to demonstrate somehow, you know, to, to government just the, the value of it, the, the essential nature of it. I know when we've gone away with our board and our executive for the last two um, retreats that we've had on strategy, they've both been in place and with community. And that's where we've spent most of our time, sitting in a place, one in a regional place, one in Western Sydney, for three days, listening to community. And I can tell you that our board comes away every time going, I can see how important the glue is in this community. So it's, it's absolutely just yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, up the back. So. Uh, thank you. I'm Bevan Warner from Launch Housing, one of the um, involved in one of the case studies. Joe, you mentioned that um, philanthropy is the least engaged sector with, or chooses when, if and when it engages with government. And um, I think this question is probably for Doug. But uh, I've just come from a donor showcasing opportunity today with. Um, People have supported us through our Cornelia program, which is um, supporting pregnant women and their babies who are experiencing homelessness to get security um, and to sort of reclaim control over their lives. Um, preschool and early years around um, early learning so that young people can learn to read in order to um, 
be able to sort of read to learn and to overcome developmental delay and all the way through to the VIVS Place program, which is permanent supportive housing um, with families in all shapes and sizes, including grandmothers and mothers and children. And sort of we've got an integrated um, suite of programs that work, have all these proof points. And the donors were all of different shapes and sizes, philanthropic trusts, individual donors. And the question became, like, well, where's, where's the scale point? You know, are we catalyzing this or we prefer bricks and mortars or, you know, we like um, services. And so you've got a diverse mix of sort of trusts and individual donors at all these proof points. And the question then becomes, how do you get something that's everyone agrees is wonderful and working to scale? So I'm wondering, Doug, in commercialising research, there might be sort of examples that you can bring from that domain to, you know, how do we get um, the people that need to make decisions to scale up and invest in things that are working to become the new normal so that the whole community sort of um, wins? Look, there's probably lots of answers to that, and I think Ramsey's probably thought about the issue of, trans, you know, of transitioning from pilot projects to um, testing those in multiple environments to kind of national impact more than any other organisation. Certainly, that was discussed um, in lots of conversations I've had with, with Ramsey people. Um, you know, I, th I think, you know, you talked about the fact that in order to be able to collaborate meaningfully over a long period of time, you need aligned interests and shared visions, and often individuals and groups don't start with those. So I think, you know, to me, it's about coming to those initial discussions with an open mind and open heart and being willing to compromise what your initial preconceptions about the path forward might be to be part of a bigger vision and, you know, to ensure each one of those groups is able to articulate to their, um, you know, the people they have to report back to that there is a place in the sun and a contribution that is meaningful. So I think it is about that compromise. It's about any group of people wanting to come together to do something bigger and more impactful than they could do alone. Well, we've got more questions that we're going to have time for. We'll, we'll take one more. I'm okay, getting permission here. What a very good question. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name's Tamara Wraith, and um, I want to um, thank the lovely lady to my right who uh, put up the topic of the not sexy um, questions in our society. And one of those at the moment, and it's huge in our society right at the moment, is mental health. Uh, particularly in medicine, um, we're doing brilliantly across the world in the research that we're doing in physical health. I work as a women's health physio, I also work with men, so I'm actually used to working with the really tricky topics, the very taboo ones. So if you think of it, all matters with the pelvis, that's the area that I deal with. So mental health is even harder. The stigma there is even greater. And then you add to that a youth lens. We are forgetting our youth at the moment. They are missing out. Um, I'm here because I'm a mother. I'm here with a major passion. Unfortunately, my passion comes from a major tragedy. And um, I won't bring that to the conversation right now. Anyone who wants to hear more can talk to me later. We have started a charitable fund called Amber's White Light. I can also look behind me and smile at beautiful Genevieve Timmons, who directed me at a very critical point on our journey to be able to start Amber's White Light through Australian Communities Foundation without having to go through the whole process of developing a foundation. What I want, though, is the big questions, the difficult questions, the ones that Sally and Joe are saying we have to have. And I agree, I've been trying to go everywhere to every politician, state, federal, to every psychiatrist in every big centre that we can find to have the difficult conversations. But we're not getting very far, very fast. The wheels are turning slowly. And part of that is, as I'm discovering, there's not enough research and there's not enough of a gender-based lens to that research. Um, we found Jay Shri Kulkarni, who's doing brilliant work here in Melbourne, so huge um, applause to her. But we need that in health and we particularly need it in mental health. Um, so a apart from 
the comments that have already been made about gender lens and health. I also think linking all the things we've said when it comes to housing um, and homelessness, a huge proportion of that is mental health. So maybe that just gives us another deep um, topic to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, I'm going to invite anyone who wants to respond, but I'm also going to, in wrapping up, give you an opportunity. We, we have an influential audience here of philanthropists, government officials, uh, community um, activists, people involved in, in doing important work. So I, I'd like to give you, each of you an opportunity to, to suggest what you would like people to take away from this discussion and from, from the research, just briefly, to, and then I'll hand back to Julie to wrap us up. So, why okay, start? I'll go. I just want to say um, thank you for those comments and something that um, we, we must reflect on is to have those fierce conversations takes courage uh, and the courage to share personal experience is, is really the deepest. So, um, so thank you. I, uh, so to take away from today, uh, as I said at the start, I am enthused and energised about the fact that we have uh, really quality substantive work that creates frameworks and platforms from which we can uh, move uh, more quickly uh, over sustained periods uh, and at scale to uh, bring a gender lens to collaborations that are focused on change. Uh, but we know that in creating uh, those types of situations, it could be any lens, I think, is, is what we're saying. Uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm really encouraging people uh, here uh, and in talking with others uh, to acknowledge the investment that's been made, uh, the intellect that's gone into it, uh, and uh, the results that are there to inform, but importantly, to actually create positive change. It would be a waste if we all walked away from this event this evening and didn't actually find a way to utilise something uh, from this valuable research to inform our own conversations uh, in organisations we're involved in to uh, create some change. The one thing we haven't uh, touched on too much tonight was the results, measuring results with a gender lens to ask those questions. Um, Liz, you really touched on it when you were saying bottom up because your team at the front line can see the results of the initiative in that case and could report back uh, by commenting on the outcome. Uh, and so I guess my challenge to everyone tonight is to measure the time that you've invested here tonight uh, and uh, the knowledge of using the framework as we go forward to actually see how it can be uh, applied. Um, we have to, in many ways, stop the talking and up the action. Liz? Happy to go. Um, I did read the material. It's fabulous. <laughs> um, it did get me thinking. So I would say read it. I would say, look at the questions. If nothing else, look at the questions. There's some great prompting questions in there to ask yourself, your board, your team, um, to just get you thinking through this lens. And the other thing, given the fabulous um, touch points we've had around glasses that I've just been sitting here thinking about, just like I have, don't just put on the glasses, because we've talked a lot about intersectionality. Put on the multifocals. <laughs> you like that one? Put on the multifocals. Um, because I know recently I was with some friends and uh, a couple of them and they were, we were looking at something on, or we needed to look at something on the phone, it was small print, and they're like, oh, they were there, but they, they couldn't read it, of course, because they didn't want to pull out their glasses even. <laughs> so, you know, pull out the glasses, put on the multifocals, and at least read the questions. <laughs> yeah. Doug? <laughs> oh, look, you've summarised it, both of you, really well. Um, I read the report too, uh, and learnt a lot uh, and have learned a lot from the conversations that we have today, things that I'll be able to take into my day job um, and, as usual, benefit from those conversations. So, 
Um, please read the resources. I say that on behalf of the research team, um, and may they be useful to you. But there, there is much provocations and, you know, stepping stones to other conversations, both in your professional and community context, and also with researchers. I think going to your observation. There's never enough research about everything, although that said, we're also not great at knitting together what does exist. So there's, there, is, there are ways and means, and we're happy to talk to you about that. Um, uh, but I think, I mean, we're all a bit tired of this, aren't we? We want to see some change. So maybe you could think about that when you leave today, is what in your sphere can you do to affect some change, and not for the people in this room, the people who are not in this room, um, who we might hope are the beneficiaries of your good thinking relationships, networks and resources. Yep. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. And, uh, please join me in thanking the panel. I'm going to hand back to you. Thank you so much, and please stay where you are because I've got um, I've got a little bit of marketing actually in the form of a gift um, to give to you. Um, but I really I don't need to do much summarising because I think you've got all those beautiful messages there. But I was sitting reflecting on a couple of things where I've been a little bit remiss, and I wanted to acknowledge um, Jill Reichstein, who's here in the room as our co-founder. Um, and I know that along with Eve has just been incredibly instrumental with so many of these infrastructure pieces, including AEGN. Um, and Amanda, I'm trying to think, how do we get a bit more, what was it? We need to be a bit sexier, apparently. So that's good, good but I really thank you, Catherine, for your, for your plug. Um, I also wanted to um, reference Michael Ulmer, who was part of a really important conversation, which in fact was probably the beginning of this piece of work for us. We commissioned Emma Dawson at Per Capita to do a piece on housing through a gender lens. Um, and Michael spoke at that. And it really, I think we took that to PRF and they said, yes, it's not just housing, it's everything. Um, so thank you, Liz, very much for your very kind comments and for all of the work um, to make it come together today. We, we actually had an extra degree of difficulty because at one point we had Sam Mostyn as our main speaker. And, um, I would have been happy to step up. Yeah, well, unfortunately, her new position as our Governor-General has required her to step off everything, but she did send her very warm regards to everyone today. Um, and I think there's been a really interesting reflection from me on just this overwhelming sort of love bomb of people who know her and who are aware of her amazingness, and yet the ugliness of our News Corp um, slice who because it was the second woman out of 29, is it, um, Governors General, that must have been um, really affirmative action and nothing to do with deserving. So, um, yeah, rage could just bubble up. Um, I, I did also want to um, mention, Gabrielle King, are you here from... Are you here? Sorry, I just really wanted to thank you. Um, Steve has been such an important collaborator and Gab's come all the way to Melbourne to be here today, and I really wanted to, to um, thank you for all the work you do. Um, so um, there are people here like Kate Temby and others who are in the impact investing space, and, and that, that's an area of real interest about how we form these collaborations. So I'm really going to encourage you to stick around, have some drinks, have some good conversations. Um, some of you will be getting up very early in the morning, I'm sure, to, to do the dawn service. And um, tomorrow's just an interesting day for me. I keep reflecting on the statistics that come out of the um, some of the international agencies that demonstrate very clearly that the stronger your gender equality, the less likely you are to have global conflicts and to have wars. And so, you know, my little plea, I guess... Um, is that we, of course, remember that many, many soldiers and many, many die in these wars, but actually if we had a few more women leading the world, I suspect we'd have a bit less conflict. Um, Sally, you mentioned uh, the 131 years. I'm a very impatient woman. I know I pretend to be patient, but really 131 years drives me crazy. Um, I was in an incredible conversation this morning with a group of people around the gender compass and Steffi from um, Plan is here today, um, who's really led a lot of this work. 
And I've heard for many years people say, look, you know what, it's just time. As we get these new generations through, it's all going to change. And, and I have a really optimistic view of that. I'm around a lot of amazing young people and I think there is real change there. But the data tells us actually that some of our younger cohort are less embracing of gender equality than men over 60. And we have a real issue in the way we support young men not to see gender equality as a threat to them, but to really have them understand and embrace the broader benefits. So, so much work to do. Um, so many more things I could say, but I just want to say thank you, really. Um, Peter, you always do such a beautiful job. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.